information provided in this presentation is intended solely for the general information of the audience. It's not medical advice and should not replace consultation with your physician or other qualified health provider. If you have any health-related questions or problems, please seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider. Now, we know that good sleep promotes good health and that sleep represents one-third of our life and it has a tremendous impact on how we live, function, and perform during other, the other two-thirds of our lives. So what I'm going to be covering today is the benefits of sleep, some common sleep disorders, signs that you may be sleep-deprived, how sleep affects different types of health, certain health conditions, some sleep distractions, what kinds of things are keeping you up, and of course, I'm going to include some helpful tips on getting a better night of sleep. Can you relate to this? At nighttime, I can't sleep. In the morning, I can't wake up. What about this one? Sleep is for people without access to the internet. So whatever your situation in life, it's likely that accessing the internet is part of your daily routine, or even it's perhaps a large part of your daily routine. In fact, staying up late online seems to be one of the fastest growing threats to good sleep. Well, I thought it'd be fun to start out with some um, facts from the animal kingdom that perhaps something we could learn about sleep habits. Did you know that sleep otter, that otters hold hands when they sleep? That way they don't drift away from each other. I thought that was so cute. Whales and dolphins literally fall half asleep. So each side of their brain takes turns so that they can come up for air. And the world's tallest animals, they are also the ones that are the most sleep deprived. These majestic creatures only sleep 30 minutes a day at five minute intervals at a time. That's according to Animal Planet. And the albatross. Now this seabird spends most of its life in the air hunting for food. So there isn't much time to snooze. That's why they have learned to multitask by sleeping while flying. So you would think it's kind of a tad bit dangerous and that the birds could fly into things. However, these birds actually practice dynamic soaring that allows them to sleep as they ride the wind currents across the oceans. Did you happen to know we are the only mammals that willingly display, delay our sleep. So how big do you think this problem is? You tell me. Use your chat button to tell me, is it A, 1 million to 3 million? Is it B, 50 to 70 million? Or C, 100 to 200 million? How many Americans have sleep-related problems? Use that chat box, A, B, or C. Take your best guess. Take your best guess. What do we got, Kristen? Ooh, this is kind of a tough one. I'm kind of getting a mix of answers, but a lot of B and Cs. But overall, I think a lot of Cs. All right. The answer is actually B. Uh-oh. It's estimated that sleep-related problems affect 50 to 70 million Americans of all ages and socioeconomic classes. Now, sleep disorders are common in both men and women. However, important disparities are prevalent and the severity of certain sleep disorders has been identified in minorities and underserved populations. All right, at least or more than 50 million Americans already suffer from over 80 different sleep disorders and another 20 to 30 million suffer intermittent sleep problems each year. At least 25 million Americans, that's about one in five adults, suffer from sleep apnea. That's a serious sleep and breathing condition that has been linked to hypertension, cognitive impairment, heart disease, and stroke. Now, chronic insomnia affects at least 10% of Americans, and a condition called Restless leg syndrome, this is a neurological disorder, affects about 5% of the population 
over age 65. Now, despite the high prevalence of sleep disorders, the overwhelmingly majority of sufferers remain undiagnosed and untreated. Now, this creates an unnecessary public health and safety problems, as well as increased healthcare expenses. Now, national surveys show that more than 60% of adults have never been asked about their quality of sleep by a physician, and fewer than 20% have ever initiated such a discussion with their physician. So, you may be asking yourself, if it's that common, how bad could it really be? Well, the consequences include drowsiness, of course, irritability, a fog that just won't lift, having trouble concentrating. For example, you're driving and you don't remember how you got to where you're going. You have difficulty putting thoughts to memory. It slows down your thought processes and your reaction time, making it difficult to focus as well, taking in new information, which so you may have trouble like sleeping or keeping your eyes open during an important meeting. Now, these experiences affect your ability to make important decisions, to safely operate a machine or a vehicle, to focus on specific tasks, or to be mentally present during an, impo- an important moment. Additionally, people are chronically sleep deprived as a result of our demanding lifestyles and a lack of education about the impact of sleep loss. Sleepiness affects vigilance, your learning abilities, your mood, your eye-hand coordination, and the accuracy of short-term memory. Sleepiness has been identified as the cause of a growing number of on-the-job accidents, automobile crashes, and transportation tragedies. So I think you would agree, lack of sleep can be bad. Here's your next question, true or false? Use the the chat box. Your brain shuts down during sleep. Is that going to be true or false? What are people saying? I am getting a lot of false, false answers. Oh, right. That would be correct. False. The brain actually remains active during sleep. Its patterns of activity change during different sleep stages, such as the rapid eye movement or REM sleep. The brain activity actually ramps up to a level that's similar to when you're awake. So far from shutting down, the shifts in brain activity during sleep are believed to be part of the of reason why. Sleep is critical to effective thinking, memory, and emotional processing. So what are some other benefits to sleep? Well, what difference could an extra hour of sleep make in your life? Maybe quite a lot, experts are saying. Studies show that the gap between getting just enough sleep and getting too little sleep may affect your health, your mood, your weight. Just to name a few. So we'll talk about better sleep, better mood, and increased energy. So there is some truth to the old saying, getting up on the right side of the bed. And this has nothing to do with which side of the bed you actually roll out of. But sleeping can lead to a good mood. And it makes sense. If you wake up and you're sleeping well, you wake up feeling rested. And being rested helps your energy levels soar. So when your energy is up, life's little challenges won't annoy you as much. So go to bed early and everyone around you will thank you for it. Now, good sleep can affect your increased productivity, decision-making, and sharper concentration. Now, sleep has been linked to improved concentration and higher cognitive function, both of which can help you be successful at work. But one night, one restless night can leave you feeling frazzled, making it more likely that you'll make mistakes. And that pot of coffee, well, that won't be able to fix it. When we talk about coffee, the more tired you feel, the more likely you are to reach for that afternoon cup of coffee, which while that may make you make, I'm sorry, while that may seem to be the fix in the afternoon, so the afternoon crash that you experience, it may seem to fix it. However, that extra caffeine late in the day could set you up for another sleepless night. Sleep helps us to have clearer thinking. 
Sleep loss affects how you think. It impairs your attention and your decision-making. You're more likely to lose things. You know how frustrating that is when you lose the car keys and other things. It also helps with better memory. Do you ever feel forgetful? So while we sleep, our brains process and consolidate the memories from the day. Without enough sleep, those memories are not stored correctly and they could be lost. Sleep helps improve with our physical health. So getting enough of these can help prevent weight gain. Now racking up an eight full hours of sleep. Now that's not going to result in losing weight all by itself, but it can help your body from packing on the extra pounds. If you don't get enough sleep, your body produces ghrelin. Now that's a hormone that boosts appetite. So you're hungrier. Now your body also decreases the production of leptin. That's a hormone that tells you you're full. So you put those together, that's a dangerous combination for late night snacking. Plus, when you don't sleep enough, you get more stressed. You don't have that energy to fight off those junk food cravings. We know a good night's sleep helps us to manage stress as well. It also helps with exercise performance. Sleep affects your ability to, for hand-eye coordination, reaction time, and muscle recovery. Plus, depriving yourself of sleep can have a negative impact on strength and power. Sleep also boosts your immune system. So when your body gets the sleep it needs, your immune cells and proteins, they get the rest they need to fight off whatever comes their way, like colds or the flu. Now, according to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, proper sleep can make vaccines more effective. Now, obviously, that's a plus. So a good night's sleep, your body repairs its muscles, it gets to recharge. Also, if you have chronic pain or acute pain, like maybe from a, free, a recent injury, getting enough sleep may actually make you hurt less. What are some common sleep disorders? Of course, there are lots of sleep disorders, lots of different types, but I'm just going to dis discuss these four that you see on your slide. Insomnia. So this is a common sleep disorder that could make it hard to fall asleep, hard to stay asleep, and cause you to wake up too early and not be able to get back to sleep. You may still feel tired when you wake up. So insomnia can affect not only your energy level and your mood, but also your health, your work performance, and your quality of life. Now, sleep apnea, this is abnormal patterns in breathing while you sleep. There's several different types of sleep apnea, but it's a potentially serious sleep disorder in which the breathing repeatedly stops and starts. So if you snore loudly or you feel tired even after a full night of sleep, you may have sleep apnea. There's a couple different types. The first one is obstructive sleep apnea. This is the more common one that occurs when the throat, the muscles of the throat, they relax and they block the airway. That's obstructive. Now, central sleep apnea occurs when the brain does not send the proper signals to the muscles that control your breathing. It's called central sleep apnea. Then there's one that's called complex sleep apnea. That's when you have both someone who has both obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea. If you think you might have sleep apnea, you should really talk with your doctor. The treatment can ease your symptoms and it might help prevent things like heart problems and other complications. Now, some of the symptoms of sleep apnea include loud snoring, episodes in which you stop breathing during sleep, which could be reported by another person. If you wake up gasping for air during sleep or you awake with a dry mouth, morning headaches, and you have difficulty staying asleep. Now, my husband was diagnosed with sleep apnea, um, and he was not a snorer. Um, he didn't snore. Instead, his breathing just slowly got more shallow and more shallow, like that. And so his body just kept waking him up like 20 times an hour. So he was never, he was always sleepy, and he never felt rested. But um, he's doing really well now. He, he received some treatment for that. Now, restless leg syndrome, this is a type of sleep movement disorder. Now, this causes an uncomfortable sensation and an urge to move your legs when you're trying to fall asleep. So it typically happens in the evening or maybe the nighttime hours when you're or sitting or when you're lying down. And 
you know, it causes the sensation to move. So when you're moving your legs, sometimes that eases the unpleasant feeling um, temporarily. Now, narcolepsy, this is a condition characterized by extreme sleepiness during the day, and you just, you, you fall asleep suddenly during the day. So people with narcolepsy often find it difficult to stay awake for long periods of time, regardless of the circumstances. And narcolepsy, narcolepsy can um, cause serious disruptions in your daily routine. We actually had a neighbor uh, who had narcolepsy. Um, it's super scary. You just fall asleep. All right. What about, I've got insomnia on a regular basis. Can I just take an antihistamine? Hello, Dr. Kretzer, can you hear me? Let me text more. Okay, I'm back. Well, that certainly woke up everybody. I don't know what happened there. My phone just completely disconnected. So, all right. So, I was talking about this question, if you have insomnia on a regular basis, can't you just take an antihistamine or some other over-counter sleep aid? Well, any, you can hear me, right, Kristen? I sure can. Hello? Thanks, Laura. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. That's okay. Um, so antihistamines can cause drowsiness, which of course might help you fall asleep for a few nights, but routine use for insomnia is not recommended. Most of the over-counter sleep aids contain antihistamines. So these products are intended to be used only for maybe two to three nights at a time. Things like stress or maybe you're traveling or other disruptions keep you awake. Now, tolerance to these sedative effects can develop quickly. And as a result, the longer you take them, the less likely they are to make you sleepy. Now, some over-the-counter sleep aids are not recommended for people who have certain conditions such as asthma or COPD or severe liver disease. Also, keep in mind these type of sleep aids are not recommended for women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. All right, here's another true false. If it takes you less than five minutes to fall asleep at night, you're probably sleep deprived. Is that true or false? What do you think? True majority or false? Of, the majority of attendees, I'll let a few folks respond here. Okay, the majority of attendees are saying false. That's actually true. Um, ideally, falling asleep should take 10 to 15 minutes. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I go all day long like the Energizer Bunny. And then as soon as my head hits the pillow, I'm out. So potentially, I might be sleep deprived. All right. So here's some signs that you are sleep deprived. So as I go through these, just kind of take a mental note of how many times your answer would be yes. If you routinely fall asleep within five minutes of lying down, are you forgetful? Sleep leads to memory consolidation and emotional processing. So without proper rest, it's harder to form memories. Things like losing the keys, things like you can't remember where you put something. Do you ever find yourself having delayed reactions? 
So not getting enough sleep impairs your ability to make split second decisions. The kind of decision making that can come in handy when we're driving or we're trying to avoid a near accident. Are you clumsy? Do you ever, you know, stumble or you feel unsteady in your feet? Skimping on our sleep can cause issues with our motor skills. Do you ever find yourself what they call like a lower threshold that you're quick to anger or sadness or tears? You know, if one more thing happens, I'm going to lose it. Do you ever feel like that? So lack of shut eye makes it harder to avoid and handle conflict. What about spacing out? If you're spacing out like while you're driving or you're doing things throughout the day with little memory of them later, such as, you know, being on autopilot, you need to get more sleep. Sleep and depression. So a well-known study by researchers at the University of North Texas found that people with insomnia are 10% more likely to develop depression and 17 times more likely to have anxiety than those who have a healthy sleep. But which came first? This is that chicken and the egg question. Does depression cause people not to sleep well or do sleep problems contribute to depression? Well, they found out that both may be the case. So research shows that by treating both simultaneously, doctors have a better shot at improving a patient's sleep quality, their mood, and their overall quality of life. What about sleep and prediabetes? Now, researchers from South Korea found that adults with prediabetes who slept six hours per night had a 44% increase in progressing to type 2 diabetes. So that's six hours a night. Those that slept five hours or less had not 44%, they had a 68% increased risk compared to those who reported sleeping seven hours each night. Now, these findings were in diabetic medicine. It was based on 18,000 adults with an average age of 41. It revealed that those who slept at least eight hours a night only had a 23% increased risk of developing diabetes. What about our heart? Our sleep is connected to our heart health, especially blood pressure. So during normal sleep, your blood pressure goes down. So when you have sleep problems, it means your blood pressure stays higher for a longer amount of time, meaning that the heart doesn't get the rest it needs. And high blood pressure is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Obesity. So lack of sleep can lead to unhealthy weight gain. So not getting enough sleep may affect that part of the brain. We talked about this. That controls hunger. We know that sleepy people are hungrier. And what do they crave? They crave the high fat, high sugar foods. And diabetes type 2. Studies show that getting enough sleep can help improve the blood sugar control. So, what is keeping you up? My bed is a magical place where I suddenly remember everything I was supposed to do. So, do you know what to do when this happens? You're supposed to write it down, maybe record it in your phone, then put it away, let it go. It'll be there when you need it. Another true, false, stress, physical or mental illness, living or sleeping arrangements, family history, shift work, diet, and exercise habits do not contribute to insomnia. True or false? All right. I'll that answer in the chat box. Yeah. Let's hope we get this one correct. Okay. <laughs> They've been doing Most great. Of, They've been doing great. They sure have. The majority of attendees are saying false, false, false. That is false. Absolutely, these things affect uh, your sleep and insomnia. Good job. All right. What about our sleep? How has your sleep changed during the pandemic? So the two main contributors to potential worsening of sleep are changes in stress levels and changes in sleep behaviors. 
So the, the pandemic and of course the related shelter in place measures have increased our stress levels. So many people are worried about the disease itself, other health issues that may not be addressed, financial issues, other psychological and interpersonal stressors. As we know, in general, worry and anxiety tend to have a negative impact on sleep. Now, the distractions and other strategies that people use to deal with stress during the day, those are not as helpful when we try to go to bed at night. Those intrusive thoughts then make it difficult to fall asleep initially or return to sleep if you're awakened in the middle of the night. However, there are actually people who are sleeping better now than before the pandemic. Those folks who are working from home, that allows them to maintain a more balanced life, hence less stress and better sleep. For example, they may be taking more breaks. They may have more interactions with people that they live with. Another example is people who were not given, do not give themselves enough time to sleep. You got to commute, you got things, other things you have to do. Well, now they can. They can give themselves enough time to sleep. However, the shelter in place has also led some people to alter the timing and their duration of sleep in ways that can be detrimental to sleep. For example, they might be less regular in when they go to sleep and when they wake up. Also, they may nap during the day. So these behaviors are, have a negative impact on our biological clock that regulates sleep and wakefulness and therefore leading to sleep problems. So think about you know, how your sleep has been affected by the pandemic. Are you getting less sleep because you're worry, anxiety, grief? Or are you getting more sleep because you're working from home, you don't have the commute, you can sleep in a little later, and that you're getting more things done earlier in the day so that you can get to bed earlier instead of having to stay up, you know, to do the things that you would normally um, not be able to get to during the day. So if you're not getting enough sleep, these tips may help you. So people of all ages need to take time to unwind. So during the unwinding period, you know, do things that you enjoy effortlessly, but make sure they're not too activating. So this is, this is a personal choice. If someone tells you to read a book or listen to calming music, that's maybe help them. But if you find that boring, you need to recognize that that is not the right thing for you. If you awake in the middle of the night and you're having difficulty falling back to sleep, take a break from trying to sleep. If you keep trying, you're just going to get frustrated or upset, which will make it even more difficult to sleep. Instead, focus on resting. During this break from trying to sleep, do something that's restful. Maybe it is reading. Maybe it's listening to content that you enjoy, just as long as it's not too activating. Getting yourself oriented for what you need to do the next day is rarely very restful. Hopping on your exercise equipment, no, no, no. That's way too activating. So those are things that you should not do. Again, what's restful for you is going to be unique to you. The important thing is to try and stop trying to sleep. Okay? Also, create a structure to your day. So this pandemic has disrupted the structure you used to have, but you have to create a new structure. This begins with starting your day roughly at the same time every morning and ideally having some social interaction early in the day. Just a phone call will do. Other things. So now whether you've had sleep problems before COVID or they've just come on recently, there are some concrete steps that you can take to improve your sleep during this pandemic. One of them is sleep specific aspects of your daily schedule. So the wake up time, setting your alarm, don't hit the snooze. So have a fixed time every day that you get started. We talked about the wind down time. It's important to relax and get ready for bed. Things like reading, stretching, meditating, along with the preparations for bed, like putting on your pajamas, brushing your teeth. You need to, given the, the stress of the pandemic, it's wise to give yourself some extra wind down time each night. Pick a consistent bedtime. This is when you actually turn out the lights and try to fall asleep. 
in addition to, to time spent sleeping and getting ready for bed, it's helpful to incorporate steady routines that provide time clues throughout the day, such as showering and getting dressed, even if you aren't going to leave the house, eating meals at the same time each day, blocking off specific time periods for work and for exercise, and reserving your bed for sleep. The sleep experts emphasize the importance of creating an association in your mind between your bed and sleep. This means that working from home should not mean working from bed. It also means avoiding bringing a laptop into bed with you to watch a movie and refreshing your bedroom setup, frequently changing your sheets, fluffing your pillows, making your bed to keep your bed fresh, creating a comfortable and inviting setting to doze off. <clears throat> also, you should spend some time outside in natural light. Even if the sun isn't shining, natural light has a positive effect on our circadian rhythm. So people find outdoor time is most beneficial in the morning. That's an added bonus. It's an opportunity to get some fresh air. As much as possible, open the windows and the blinds that let in the light during the day. Also be mindful of screen time. You know this, that blue light produced by the electronic devices, such as your mobile phone, your tablet, that has been found to interfere with the body's natural sleep promoting processes. As much as possible, try to avoid using those devices at least an hour before bed. You can also use device settings or special apps that will reduce that or filter that blue light. True or false, turning up the radio, opening the window, or turning on the air conditioner are effective ways to stay awake when you're driving. True or false. All right, let's see. Well, Laura, personal story, when I moved from Minnesota to California, my eye doctor told me to do all of these things that you mentioned on the screen. So I'm going to say true. And most everybody that are responding are also saying true. So the answer is true. The answer Please is say false. True. What? Okay. Oh, no. Drowsy driving is extremely dangerous. And these tricks are ineffective and especially worrisome if they keep a sleepy driver behind the wheel. So if you're feeling tired while you're driving, it's best and safest to pull off the road into a safe area where you can nap for 15 to 30 minutes or simply stop for the night. What about those caffeinated drinks? Now those may help for a short period, but it's gonna take time for the caffeine to kick in. And even then it's risky to rely on caffeine to keep you alert when you're driving. So the best way to deal with drowsy driving is to prevent it in the first place by getting a good night of sleep before your trip. When in doubt, err against driving if you're at all sleepy because the consequences can be life-threatening to you and others on the road. So what are some typical things that really affect our sleep? Having that glass of wine after dinner now, many people think a nightcap is just the thing to help them relax. They can fall asleep, but it can backfire. As the body breaks it down, it can have a stimulating effect, keeping you from those deeper stages of sleep, even causing you to wake often throughout the night. Your smartphone. We talked about this. The light given off from the smartphones, the laptops, even the TVs can mess with your body's production of melatonin. That is the hormone that helps you fall asleep at night. And in just a few minutes, I'm actually going to give you some tips on how you can use technology, including your cell phone, for a better night of sleep. Watch the bedtime snack. A small snack at night is fine, just not a lot of carbohydrates, chips, pretzels, popcorn. Those things are going to raise your blood sugar. Then the insulin is going to be released into the bloodstream. Then the glucose is going to drop. And then the hormone like cortisol is going to be released. That's a stress hormone. And the seesawing back and forth can make it really hard for you to fall asleep and stay asleep. So a healthy carb and a protein are a better choice for a snack. 
sleeping in, stay consistent with your bedtime and your wake time. Sleeping in can upset that natural circadian rhythm. Your room's, your bedroom's temperature. So studies show that the room's temperature below 65, and I really do like it on the cold side, but anyway, below 65 and above 75 affect, affect the sleep cycles. So you need to kind of keep it in between 65 and 75. Of course, your mattress. A bad mattress or a pillow that doesn't support your body rights spells bad news for sleep. You should buy a mattress about every eight years or as needed. When your life changes, things like maybe a car accident or a back injury, that can change your, your mattress needs. If you wake stiff and sore every morning, it's time to shop for a new mattress. Other sleep disruptors, distractions and disruptors, watching the clock. You got to keep that clock out of sight so that you're not tempted to look at it. Clock watching causes stress and makes it harder to go back to sleep if you wake up during the night. Also, the position of your head. You want to sleep with your neck in a neutral position. What about your pet? Fido may have to go, guys, to his own bed and not yours. And pain. Discomfort is a sleep disruptor. So if you have back pain, put a pillow between your legs or even use a full body pillow. So how do we create a space ideal for sleep? You want to prep for bed, dim the lights, read a book, but avoid using the tablets with that blue light. Keep light, noise, and temperature at levels that are comfortable that won't disturb your rest. Getting regular exercise. Keep in mind, exercising too close to bedtime may interfere with sleep. Only go to bed when you're sleepy. So if you aren't sleepy at bedtime, do something relaxing that will help you wind down. Avoid those daytime naps. That can really throw off your sleep cycle. How can we use technology? Okay, it's likely your smartphone is on your nightstand. That's just where it is. It's within arm's reach It's for that late, at, late night text or the ping or the email. So 95% of us use electronics right before bedtime. So countless studies show that nighttime phone use can disrupt your sleeping pattern. And whether it's you're checking social media or maybe you're playing a game, using a mobile device can keep your brain stimulated and alert. Those are two things that you want to avoid when you're trying to fall asleep. But for many of us, our phone keeps us connected. And we, it, sometimes it serves as an alarm clock. So in, in today's technology-driven society, it's really impractical to simply say, oh, mobile devices should be banned from the bedroom. So what is a busy professional to do? Well, surprisingly, certain technology can actually promote a better night's sleep. From learning about your key smartphone features to downloading slumber-inducing apps, use these tech tips to, keep, to help you catch some more Zs. Now, the apps and the products shown on this slide, this is just for information only. HealthNet is not endorsing any of these apps or products, um, but there are many apps out there that can help you relax and wind down. Many of them are free. They offer soothing music or relaxation exercises, such as guided imagery. It helps to get a busy brain to quiet down. And the American Sleep Association has a list of a lot of different apps things that play combination of guided meditation, melodies, sounds that can soothe you. Some play music. Others are binaural beats remixed each night based on what you like or dislike. Some actually, some apps will actually record your sleeping habits and they ring you up, ring you to wake you when you enter your lightest sleep phase. My husband has one of those. It's on his phone, on his wrist. And so it beeps as he's in the morning, as he's entering the lightest sleep phase. There's apps that play sounds, natural sounds, rain, water, crickets, ocean waves, apps that do meditations for relaxation, meditations specifically for sleep, also for mindful breathing, visualization exercises, progressive muscle relaxation exercises that help you to let go of the day's events or anxiety. Also, you can use your fitness tracker or, the, or a sleep app 
to monitor your sleep patterns. Now, the accuracy of these is not the gold standard. However, the data provided gives you an insight into how you're sleeping. But if wearing technology to bed isn't your thing, then consider using an app such as Sleep Cycle that uses your phone's microphone and it picks up any subtle noises such as movement while you are asleep. So rather than limit technology, try to use it in the bedroom. For example, there's a picture on here of Dodow. Now this is a device that projects a soft, gentle, pulsating light onto the ceiling, which you synchronize with your breath. So you inhale as the light expands, you exhale as the light contracts. So the goal of this is to slow your heart rate down and to gently lull you to sleep. Um, it runs for eight or 20 minutes and then it turns itself off. Of course, there's so many products out there like the ones that's a, like a sleep, uh, it's a headphone, um, it's Bluetooth, wireless, and it comes in a sports sweatband. You can use that for sleeping, working out, jogging, yoga, insomnia, travel, meditation. Okay, there's a picture of that on the screen as well. Using the nighttime mode on your cell phone or your tablets or other portable electronic devices that are equipped with a nighttime mode. That's easier on your eyes before bed. Now, if you don't have that already programmed into your phone manually, dim the display uh, so that will help. Another option is a smart bed. Perhaps certain types offer, certain types of, of beds offer climate control, pressure adjustments, even a low frequency sleep promoting vibrations. Also, if noise in the environment or your partner's snoring is keeping you awake, consider using a white noise machine. That's used to create a soothing backdrop to dr drown out bothersome noises. And other home tech devices can automatically dim your lights, depending on the time of the day, creating a more sleep-ready atmosphere. So here's some final tips on what you can do tonight to get a better night of sleep. Stick to a regular sleep schedule, going to bed at the same time each night, getting up in the morning, that includes the weekends, getting enough natural light, especially early in the day, going for a morning or a lunchtime walk, Try to avoid that artificial light, especially a few hours before bedtime and using a, a blue light filter. Don't eat or drink within a few hours of bedtime, especially things like alcohol and foods high in, in fat and sugar. <clears throat> Keeping your room cool, dark, and quiet. Also, work with your healthcare team to identify obstacles to good sleep, including medical conditions. Especially if you're not able to get a good night's sleep on a regular basis. I mean, every once in a while we have, you know, a bout of insomnia or such. But on a regular basis, you really should work with your doctor. They can review your sleep habits. Maybe it's medication related or symptoms such as pain or other chronic illnesses that are preventing you from getting your Z's. And if you're worried or stressed or anxious about something, you may want to consider talking with a mental health professional. Now, these last couple of slides are going to be on our programs that we offer for our members. Certainly, we have a lot of information on our wellness portal. So when you log on to your HealthNet account, you'll be able to see our wellness portal with all kinds of information and programs online. Working with a health coach. Health coach may be help to help you as well, especially if, you know, the sleep is related to anxiety or stress management. <clears throat> it's always good to, to work with a coach. You work with them one-on-one, -on -one, plan some goals, strategize a plan, and, and help you. If you have health concerns, our members can always reach a nurse uh, through the nurse advice line anytime, day or night. Now, we talk about my strength, you know, each time that we have a webinar. So, this is a self um, Self-Help Health Club for Your Mind. Uh, it's, our members can browse through different topics and they have many topics to choose from. They are tailored to your own personal profile. And you can see on the bottom, uh, HealthNet members, how you can sign in as well as our community can, can access it as well. So you don't have to be a HealthNet member, HN community. If you are a UC or CalPERS, then you have specific um, links there on how to uh, sign into MyStrength. The really nice thing about MyStrength is they have a whole 
sleep program. So it's a guided program to help you improve your sleep. So with my strength, you can build a progressive sleep improvement plan. You track your sleep in order to connect better sleep with better health. Now, my strength uniquely supports a range of behavioral health issues integrated with the sleep program. So that's including support for conditions that generally co-occur with lack of quality sleep, such as stress and anxiety. So with my strength street sleep resources, that's going to help train the mind and the body to promote quality sleep by building healthy sleep habits, encouraging sleep conducive mindsets, and optimizing personalized sleep schedules. <clears throat> of course, our members have access to our discounts, whether it's a weight management program, such as Weight Watchers, or massage therapy, or even a membership to our network of gyms and workout centers that have a lot of on-demand programming. Make sure you check those out. And last but not least, next month in May, Mental Health Month, we're gonna be talking about mindfulness. Now this webinar is designed as an introductory lesson, so you're gonna learn about the basics and the benefits of mindfulness and how to incorporate it in your lifestyle. We'll be talking about the origins of mindfulness and the way you can apply it to different life situations, including the workplace, how to manage stress, excuse me, the benefits of meditation, healthy, mindful eating, and we're also going to practice some mindfulness exercises. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you so much for joining me today. <clears throat> if you haven't done already so, please text Kristen if you're in a conference room or if you used a single sign-on for more people, if you could text Kristen, that number, that'll be for our attendance purposes. I hope that we will see you or, or you will join us next month. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your time.